stay in the word, keep looking upward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, YouTube is fine, Facebook is fine as far as telecasting some of the uh, services that we have, but nothing like rubbing shoulders with one another. You know, being here, being able to see people face to face and, and find out what's going on. I, I know that uh, we've been hit by a very serious uh, crisis with uh, Hurricane Laura. And as you look out over the city, when you first came back, it looks much different now than it did then. We're on our way to recovery. There's a lot of things that uh, you know have been taken care of, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. There's more that needs to be done versus what's already been done. So uh, you know, we anticipate the Lord to make all the provisions and things that are needed to make that uh, recovery complete. But we need each other. You know, the Bible says, "Forsake not the assembling of yourself together." as is the habit of some, but all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I think we're very very close, very close to the coming of the Lord, through the rapture, through the coming of the Lord and the appearing in the clouds and taking his church out of here. But in the meantime, we're to occupy, we're to uh, come and do what we can do to reach as many people for Christ. And what I, one of the things that I was really encouraged by, we had a group from Arkansas that came and tarped the roof at Calvary and uh, when they came out to tarp the roof, they were telling us a, a story. They said that during this time, over 80 people have accepted the Lord since they've been here. And they said that that's the, that's the most people that have responded uh, to the gospel call uh, in any place that they've ever been. And they've covered a lot of storms in the last 20 years. And uh, it's very encouraging to hear that people's hearts are open to hear the gospel. Uh, Sometimes it takes a crisis for people to open up their heart. Or they just need someone to arbitrarily just, you know, uh, go out there and share the gospel and let them know that Jesus saves and that Jesus can save them. Yeah. And uh, what an encourage that, encouragement that that was uh, as I was hearing them talk. And they're really on fire for Jesus. And we had a group from Covington come and chainsaw and cut trees away from the road to get back there. And it's, it's, it's neat. And we've got a uh, a mission group coming uh, here on Tuesday night, and uh, they're going to be passing out food and water and various uh, cleaning supplies, all sorts of things. And uh, we're going to set that up on site, and people will drive past, and we can we can help them uh, do that. But there's about 15 of them coming, and uh, but they're going to uh, be working. We're going to not only be passing out food, but if you notice, there's some limbs out front. We're going to use some of their youthful muscle to get that, uh, the tree that we cut uh, a couple days ago, get that out to the street and uh, and then do various uh, things that need to be done around here. So we just, uh, you know, it's a different kind of schedule that we're keeping right now. We can, we do things as we get there. Hopefully next week we'll be able to uh, meet uh, with air conditioning. This is, uh, you can take away a lot of things, but don't take away the air conditioning. <laughs> But uh, hopefully we'll get the air conditioning, uh, you know, finished up uh, by Tuesday. Uh, I talked to Edith last night. And she's coming back today. She gets on the plane at 10:30 in Dallas, and she arrives back at the airport at noon. And so uh, I told her uh, what the problem was. They the electric is run out here, but they did not feel comfortable hooking the electric to the church to the service pole until an electrician saw it because it's a three-phase breaker. I'm not an electrician. I don't know much about that, but whatever it was, they said they didn't feel comfortable. They wanted to make sure that when that new pole was put out there, that uh, the hookups are correct so we don't uh, you know, burn out some of the uh, appliances here in the house of the air conditioner. So, so all is, you know, working. It's just one speed, and that's slow. You know, nothing happens real fast, but uh, we're so glad to see you here this morning. And we trust that uh, the Lord's blessing you, and I know He is. You hear stories, more and more stories about the blessing that the Lord has, has given and through throughout this time. We want to continue to pray for Laura. She's in Cata, Katy, Texas. Uh, her trailer was destroyed, uh, and she's not able to uh, come back. She's going to live with her daughter, Angela. So we want to uh, pray for her. She called and asked for her yesterday. And uh, we just want to just love lift our entire church family prayer is so absolutely important at this time. Now, Emmanuel was supposed to be here, and I'm not sure. He said many people evacuated. He said only one out of five are still here. Four out of the five are evacuated, and I think the evacuation mandate for evacuation
evacuation was over yesterday, so they should be trickling back. So uh, that's an older congregation, several, a lot of older people, so we want to uh, be in prayer for them. I don't know whether it was a missed cue or whatever, but uh, he was supposed to be here as well. But we're glad you're here today, and we want to be able to encourage you to God's Word. And it said, the outline that I have this morning is very simple, and I think that all of us as Christians, the responsibility that we uh, have as a Christian is to keep looking to Jesus, you know, keep our eyes focused upon Him. Uh, you know, He's the author and the finisher of our faith, and, uh, you know, He endured the cross, He went through various trials and sufferings and, and things, and I think that as you go through these things, you've got to look at the example that we have, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to realize that you know, life sometimes gets very difficult, but you got to keep your eyes focused on the end zone. You know, uh, that end zone is what the football players uh, look forward to. Uh, every offensive lineman, their goal is to get to the end zone. Our goal is to attain salvation, to re realize we're going to have salvation at the end, and the reward for faithful service to Christ are going to be abundant. But the outline that I have today is very simple. And uh, first of all, you know, the first uh, major point is we're to serve Christ without reservation, you know, without holding back. In a time like this, it really uh, it, uh, accentuates, uh, brings out uh, where our heart is. And uh, it's really easy to serve the Lord when everything's going your way. You know, when everything's going hunky-dory, swell, everything's falling into place just right, it's easy to serve the Lord. But then when the crisis comes, it's very difficult. Sometimes it gets difficult when you want to be a quitter. And it really brings out, you know, uh, if there's any reservation about serving the Lord. And you've got to keep your mind focused on the worthwhileness of all this. And uh, there's many things we can say about reservation. Uh, first of all, James, James chapter 1. If you have your Bible, you might want to turn over to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1. Uh, he calls it being double-minded, and we sure don't want to be double-minded. We want to keep our eyes focused upon the Lord. And uh, in James chapter 1, and it says, you know, at a time like this, do you find yourself praying more than you ever did before? Probably so. Lord, the air conditioner doesn't work. The electric doesn't work. Where's the electrician? Uh, we don't have any water. Where are we going to find water? The basic necessities. And, uh, you know, everything's reduced down to the minimum. And uh, James chapter 1, uh, this is about the only time that you'll ever hear me talk about liberal. Because the Lord here in James chapter 1 tells us that we can get an unlimited liberal supply of wisdom if we need it. We need wisdom at a time like this. And uh, in James chapter uh, 1, it says, My brethren, uh, verse 2, count it all joy when you... Uh, into, into diverse temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, and wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith uh, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For uh, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So, you know, you gotta you got to come to the grips with the Lord has a plan for all this. The Lord didn't just like to let this happen and just like coincidentally. This is a tap on the shoulder to wake up. It's a wake-up call for us as Christians to prioritize what's really important in this life. How many piles of garbage have you seen out in front of every house in Lake Charles? In, in Sulphur, it's mountains. Everything's all piled up. Several of our houses that where we live around us are totaled. Trees fell upon them. And they took things that they never could use again and they put it out to the street. And it, you know, it, it just reinforces that idea that you know we spend a lifetime collecting things for a garage sale or for the Salvation Army. You know, things that you pay 50 or $60 for, like a pair, a pair of jeans or a shirt or a coat. You know, at a garage sale, it goes for about a nickel 
are 10 cents. Sometimes you can pick them up for free. And you know, you realize that sometimes you spend a whole lifetime collecting things for a garage sale. What's really important? And uh, these times that we go through, you know, it, it's like, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? You realize the Lord has the answer for every one of those things. But you got to turn to Him. And we've got to be trained in such a way that our first sense is to trust the Lord with it instead of getting frightened or fearful or uh, burdened or, you know, worried about these, some of these things. And uh, I know that uh, many people gather in their, you know, their place of refuge, like when they evacuated and they found strength and evacuated. Other people stayed, in, stayed, stayed around town uh, during, the, during the evacuation. But the fact is, you put your trust in the Lord. He takes care of us. He's our protector. He's our fortress. And, the, and he's the one that we are looking to to defend us and to protect our life. But if you act lack wisdom, let them ask of God, because there's there's no sense in being unstable. What happens when you uh, get unstable? Everything that comes up is always a question. Should I do it? Should I not do it? You, you ever notice how hindsight is always easier than foresight? It's always easier to say, well, I should have done this or I should have done that. You've got to believe that God, when you ask him to, to give you wisdom, that he gives you that wisdom and you stand upon the wisdom based upon the word of God. He's going to take care of us. A lot of, a lot of times we get so fearful we just want to retreat. I know it crosses your mind from time to time. Maybe you ought to just sell it. Go out and find some 40 acres somewhere and just put a fence around it and just say forget about all these problems. But the problem is if you evacuate and if you if you leave the area, you're going to go to, say you go to California, you got wildfires tsunamis. You got, uh, you go into Missouri and you've got earthquakes, you've got tornadoes, you've got freezing weather, you've got unbelievably cold winters for that, that part of the country. The Lord's going to use these things in our life. We're here and we, we've got to realize that we're to serve the Lord without reservation. Once you put your hand to the plow, keep that hand to the plow and go forward. Don't be looking over your shoulder to the right or the left. I remember the days when, when I used to go up to Natchitoches, outside of Natchitoches, and watch my uncle, uh, you know, plant corn and, and various things in his garden. I always wondered, how did they ever get those straight lines? If I had a string and pulled from one end of the road to the other, I still couldn't get a straight line. But you see, he kept his eyes focused on the fence post at the end of the road, and by keeping his eyes focused he kept making a straight path so that whenever the corn would come up out of the ground, it looked like it was symmetric. It was all put together perfect. But uh, it was just keeping his eyes focused. And we've got to keep our eyes focused upon Jesus. What does Jesus want us to do? And uh, so we're to serve the Lord with, uh, with all uh, single-mindedness. Say, I'm doing this for the Lord. You want to help somebody? Go out and help them. You know, whenever you see someone that uh, is in need, go out there and try to help them. If they need groceries, buy some groceries. There's plenty of people out there providing meals, and uh, we try to make that uh, aware to everyone that there's food available to people. There's no reason a person should be going without. The only person I say we really need to really be watchful over is the elderly who cannot go to those places and get the food. So while this, this mission group that's coming on Wednesday to pass out food, we're not only going to pass out food here, but we're going to go to some of the neighborhoods where some of the elderly cannot make it to the church to be able to pick the food and the, and the water up and make it available to them. Uh, sometimes it's just a word of encouragement. And I told Glenn, that Glenn Tyson is in his group there from Bailey, First Baptist Church, I said, you know, don't be surprised when you knock at the door and you find out people have been sitting there for a week without something. Because they're too proud, proudful, prideful to uh, speak up and say, I have a need. You know how difficult it is to say, I have a need. And uh, so we're going to go out and try to find people that maybe have not been able to uh, get to food and water and various uh, cleaning supplies and, and paper supplies, that type of thing.
But you, you know, when you determine in your mind, this is what I'm going to do, stick with it. A quitter, a person who, who quits, never gets the joy of really serving Jesus. The second thing is no retreats. You know, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, if you have your Bible, you might want to turn over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Very common verse right here, but uh, it's Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Here it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, uh, when you're, you're thinking in terms of uh, the retreating, you realize that you gave your life to Jesus. At some point in time, you give your life to Jesus. If you were to put your life on a linear line, and you were to put an X where it marked in your life where you accepted the Lord, that's a point in time that the Lord came into your life, and the life began to change. And uh, that's an aorist tense verb, by the way. And that means it's an action that happens at a point in time, and it has lasting results. So whenever you determined and said, I want to accept the Lord Jesus as my Savior, you're no longer yours, but you're His. You're a child of God. You became a part of the family of God. And from that day forward, you're to live as, as that. It's no longer me that lives, but it's Christ that lives within me. That is a great mystery, how you can sit there and say, yeah, I'm living, I'm having a good time, but then... On the other hand, it's Christ that lives within you. And the life that you now live, you live by faith in the Son of God. And so it's a, it's a strange dichotomy. It's a strange relationship because you are living, sure enough, you've got flesh and bones. And uh, you've got uh, all the, uh, the, the, the uh, physical aspects of having your own body. But Christ lives within you. In the life that you live now, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. This thing's changed life. And so, you know, you can't retreat. You know, like if you try to run away from the Lord, you can't do it. If you're really a child of God, you can't run away from him. He will sit there and he will convict you and he will work on you. And, you know, it's like that decision, you know, was a decision that was uh, significant. It was uh, a life changer. Your eyes were opened up to appreciate the value of Christ. What a, you know, what a change. And, you know, like, uh, you want to make sure that you don't retreat. At a time like this, you just want to quit. I mean, you get tired of cleaning. You get tired of pulling sheetrock. You get tired of getting out there and putting four by fours in a patio that's been blown off. I mean, it's like, you get tired. But you got, you got to go forward because you realize it's no longer you that live, but it's Christ that lives within you. And uh, this is all immaterial. How, how many of y'all have come across the point where you realize all this stuff is going to pass? All this stuff is just temporary. You know, we spend our lifetime trying to maintain what we've got. But we're looking forward to a city whose builder and maker is God. And that's eternal, and it, and it's, it does not decay. It's not susceptible to any sort of, of uh, erosion, anything anything at all. No hurricanes in heaven. Amen to that one. <laughs> no tornadoes in heaven. And, you know, and uh, we look for this city whose builder and maker is God. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I'd have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. We look forward to that day, you know, and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, you're trying to keep your eyes focused on getting the job done here, but you keep going back and think, wait until we get to heaven, how beautiful that's going to be. Right now, right now, creation, I have a, I have a study that I want to present for one night. I want, to, I want to talk about how this creation has been affected by the fall. And creation resists man right now. We have tornadoes. We have wildfires. We have earthquakes. We have tsunamis. We have generally, you know, bad, bad weather. I mean, 
elements seem like they resist against man. But one day, all, in fact, in Romans chapter 8, where it talks about all of creation groaning, one day, this creation is going to be liberated, and it's going to be uh, able to function the way that it was created to function. In the millennium, it's a preview. Because uh, during the millennium, which is a thousand-year reign of Christ following the tribulation, some of the curses are going to be removed, and people's eyes are going to be bug-eyed when they sit there and say, I can't believe that. The minute that I plant that seed in the ground, as soon as I get finished planting my entire field, it's going to be ready to harvest. And look at the animal kingdom. The lion uh, will lay down the lamb. And it's just uh, all the animals, the creation of the animals will all be different. A, a small child can pick up a snake and not be bitten. Isn't that amazing? And uh, the curses will be removed mostly. But in heaven, they'll all be removed. So we don't need to retreat. You know, we don't need to retreat and think, looking over our shoulders and say, well, you know, what What if I do this? Well, what if I do that? Serve the Lord. Give me your whole heart. Don't resist. Uh, how many of y'all like to go to buffets? Everybody like to go to buffets? <laughs> I tell you, you know, you go to a buffet and you have your choice of, you know, like at Ryan's or a Piccadilly's or something like this. You've got your choice of all sorts of things. And you, and you realize that generally you go to the same thing all the time. You know, I, I, I like certain of the foods, so that's what I'll pick. Uh, they used to, there used to be a day I used to like the, you know, the uh, dessert bar. Not so much anymore, but it's like you pick out the things that you want but, and the things that you choose. And a lot of times it's the same thing. But with the Lord, we've got we've got to take the entire the entire bundle of what Christ has given to us. He's chosen us to be able to honor him in the wonderful times, but then also we have to learn to trust him in the times of suffering, in the times of hardship. We've got, and this is the most uh, intense time that we learn the most about the Lord is when we go through trials. So we have to realize we don't retreat. Now, Thirdly, and I'll make this real short. Thirdly, we want to we want to make sure that we don't have any regrets. You know, if we look back on our life, and if there's some pitfalls, and there's a time that you sit there and say, "Why am I having to struggle for this?" We got we've got to look back and say, "You know what? I don't know what the result is going to be. I don't know how many people I've affected for the Lord. I don't know what kind of impact I've had in other people." But you know, my trust is in the Lord, and I'm not going to regret what I, what's happened. And you know, you go through all kinds of things in your life. There's serious things that happen in your life. And uh, you look at it and say, man, why? It's just such a waste. But from God's perspective, look at 2 Timothy. I'd just like for us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. In fact, I'm going to start reading in verse 6 because... It really shows you the Apostle Paul. How do you like the Apostle Paul after he administered and began so started so many churches that he could only pick out maybe a, two or three people that would be helpful to him at the time of his death? Second Timothy was written close to the time of his death, and uh, and he was uh, seeking to read the Scripture, and then he wanted others to be around him to encourage him. He's a good soldier comfort of a good soldier finds. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to unto all them also that love his appearing. So there's a crown of righteousness those who await and look upward to the coming of the Lord. We, you know, you realize that uh, you can't look back and second guess things. All these things that have happened in our life happen for a reason. And uh, some good, some bad. But the Lord will sort all that out in the end. He is going to, at the judgment seat of Christ, those things will be sorted out. He 
you'll see the pains and the, and the difficulties and the challenges that you found that maybe no one else ever knew, but yet he is the righteous judge. And we have to trust him that uh, he is going to take care of that. We just, in our, in our life, we can't be impacted by worrying about, well, that part of my life was such a waste. Hey, the Lord has a purpose. He has a reason that we go through everything. You know, God says in his word in Romans chapter, all things work together for good to them that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And so we got to look at this from a standpoint of uh, not having regrets, not having retreat, not to retreat, and not to have any reservation about serving the Lord. Don't regret. I, I remember one missionary lady that stood up in our church in Louisville when we ministered in Louisville, Texas, that... Uh, she, on a Wednesday prayer meeting, she said this, and this is verbatim. She said she raised her hand, and she, as the pastor was uh, leading the prayer meeting that night, they got to the time of sharing. She, she said, she said, Pastor Mercer, I have a, I have a regret. And everybody, whoa, no, she has a regret. We're all in trouble. But she proceeded by saying, she said, I, I have a regret that I only have one life to live. Because if I had another one, I would do it the very same way. She was a missionary in Africa, and she spent over 50 years in Africa ministering to people that were heathen. And she lost a lot. She lost about three or four of her children in the soil of Africa. And uh, But she said, if I only had one life, if I had another life, I'd live it just the same way that I lived my, my life. Because it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile serving Jesus, every bit of it. And uh, we're here for a reason, and that's to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, to know him and to make him known, the chief aim of man. Let's go ahead and look to the Lord and pray at this time. Our Father, we're so grateful for the privilege that we have to gather together. And I pray the time that we're able to spend together be a time of encouragement and strength. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to us and the grace that's been given to us to be able to endure some of these things. Sometimes we don't know which direction to go, what priority to establish in our life to, to get these things back in order. And Lord, we just pray for those who have had so much of their, their lives destroyed because of, whether it be their home, their cars, their job, whatever it might be. Lord, we pray that you give them grace to be able to endure under such hardship. We just thank you for the time that we're able to spend together. And I pray that as a result of all this, that uh, we would have a greater appreciation for one another, how important it is to have believers of like faith and to be able to gather together and to worship the Lord, and to be able to break the bread of life, and to be able to hear from God's Word. And Lord, we know that the age in which we're living is turning very bold against uh, the Lord, against the things of the seems to be an antichrist spirit. Father, I pray that uh, we would be the light of the world, that Christ in us would shine forth very brightly, that people would see there's a difference that Jesus makes. Jesus can save, Jesus can give direction in our life, and give us the strength to endure things that are hardship. 